Every year, Startup Grind hosts our SG Women Month, proudly recognizing the accomplishments of successful women leaders all over the world. These women are founders, venture capitalists, engineers, executives, educators, and more, who represent our community all around the world. This month, SG Women Month is proudly presented by Silicon Valley Bank and Google for Startups. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Shachar. Thank you to Brain Embassy and, of course, to Iris Shul. I'm very, very happy to see you guys. We were just talking about how amazing yet weird it is to see people in the same room together. So thank you for, so much for making the effort, getting into your car, or taxi, or bicycles, and making all the way uh, in time to get here. Um, this is the first Startup Grind Frontel event in a year and a half, probably. Um, my name is Liron Glickman. I'm a business development consultant. And I'm very excited to um, have Iris Shur with me today. And Hi. How are you, Iris? I'm, I'm good. I'm also very, very excited to see real people. Um, I gave a couple of uh, talks uh, via Zoom during the COVID and uh, it was always very weird to see all these closed cameras. And so I'm happy that you can close your camera and uh, to be here. No squares, right? No yeah. squares this time. It's better, actually. <laughs> Fantastic. So we are here to interview Iris, as you know, and learn more about your path as an entrepreneur, as a founder, as, as a woman in this industry. And as you know, this is for Startup Grind. May is the month of women, and we were fortunate to have different women uh, in our stages, and again, today, this year, Iris is with us. So allow me to share a bit about you, and then we'll, uh, we'll give you the microphone, as they say. Okay. Um, so hi again. <laughs> um, I'm a certime entrepreneur, um, so a serial entrepreneur um, with a, a very long and uh, diverse journey. Um, I didn't start with the right, uh, like with the most common path for entrepreneurship. Uh, I studied architecture in uh, Bezalel. Um, I had a bit of technical background, but I, I was never a, a real developer. Um, and I, was, uh, I never intended to become an entrepreneur. It wasn't something that uh, felt natural to me. I was always uh, pretty shy. Uh, when I was just about to graduate architecture school, uh, I decided that I don't want to be in architecture. I uh, wasn't sure what to do with my life. Um, I left school when I was uh, at the end of the fourth year out of uh, five years. Uh, my parents were devastated. Um, and um, with a few friends from the, from the army, I started to think, what, what am I going to do now? One of them said, like, let's start a startup uh, because we saw some other people that uh, served with us that managed to raise money, and it seems like uh, the easy solution. Um, it was a very, very long journey, so it took us like a year and a half to raise uh, the first round. Um, we've done all the possible mistakes that, uh, that can be made, uh, but we learned a lot, and uh, after a few years, we started to get the hang of it, and. Uh, and managed to raise more money, and uh, three and a half years after we started the company, it was acquired by uh, Autodesk. Um, I've been there for two years, and then co-founded another company, a very different one. By the way, the first company was around uh, the world that came from of architecture, of uh, 3D modeling, and how to take it to the web and the mobile. And my second company was around uh, uh, developers and DevOps and how to monitor a uh, production environment. I was there for four years, uh, so very interesting journey. Um, I learned a lot, um, and then I started a new company, this time by myself, um, called Oribi. Uh, we raised over $27 million to date. Uh, we have 700 customers. Um, and uh, I'll probably share more about me and the, <laughs> and the company as we'll speak. Now, of course, everything you said, you said is, is, is so impressive and it's not um, as common, obviously, with having three companies and so on. Um, I have to ask an, another, because you talked a bit about your childhood and about your, you, you thought you want to be an architect. 
architecture. And today, actually, I know that your brother is also a startup founder, right? Yeah. So it's something that runs in the family in a way. Like after yeah. your parents were devastated, they were like, no, no, okay, it's, maybe uh, it's good. It's, it's pretty <laughs> weird that both of us are entrepreneurs. Um, and my father is an engineer. My uh, my mother works for uh, like um, used to work for Shirute um, Adam, so something. Mm -hmm. They're very much. Uh, um, my um, my father's dream was that I will learn as a technion, no matter what. And my my mother wanted me to be a dentist. Um, and uh, the entire family is very much uh, like get your degree and find a good job and yeah. stay there for the next 30 years mm -hmm. um, so i'm not sure what about what happened on our education that yeah. led, led us us there oh. but it's good yeah yeah <laughs> obviously it's good so that was like early days and kind of your career now as i said earlier this now it's oh thank you yeah, so much great. it will allow us to shout less okay can you hear us good so um as I said, this is the, the Women's Month here in Startup Grind, and some of the women that we had are um, Adi Sofer Tehani from Facebook and Dr. Orna Berry. And, you know, your name as an entrepreneur um, and founder traveled wide and, and far, as they say, uh, here in the ecosystem and abroad. And I want to start with, you know, a female-related question. So you, as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, co-founder at some point, um, do you think that your journey as a female entrepreneur is different than the one that men entrepreneurs are having? Yeah. Well, I'm not crazy about female-related <laughs> uh, questions. Um, I, I'm sure it's different, but uh, I have to say that I don't deal with it too much because I feel that um, um, it, it takes too much energy. Um, I, I can share a story that uh, I think like a year or two um, into my entrepreneurship with my first company, um, I, I had this fight with my co-founder and we were about to cold call someone that we wanted him to partner with us and uh, I said that I can't call him because we just hear a female and he's saying that we, we're not serious and uh, um, he'll it will probably pass better if uh, he'll hear a voice of a man. Um, and then I, I just thought to myself, well, I can't behave like this all the time and keep thinking about uh, what they'll think and uh, how should I behave and who should they present the company. So I, I'm sure it's different. I think that um, it can be more challenging. I do think that it has lots of advantages. Um, to be? To be a female entrepreneur. So it's much easier to get coverage and uh, I think it's easier to hire employees um, so there are advantages, um, and um, I I'm pretty happy with my decision not to not to waste too much energy about it and just be who I am, re mm -hmm. regardless to to the gender. Thank you, thank you very much. And that being said, you know you had a very um, long and interesting journey, I would say. And I'm sure that today you, you obviously you're much more mature as an entrepreneur. And I want to ask, what are one or the main traits that you had to acquire throughout your journey uh, in order to survive in these you know, startup ecosystems? Um, a lot. Mm -hmm. and like <laughs> the, the one thing that I, I love and hate most about startup life is that every month or so you need to, to learn a new skill. Um, I think probably like the main thing for me um, was uh, was learning new skills. Um, mm -hmm. So w when I started my first company, um, I, I told everyone, "Okay, I'm going to be the product uh, manager and um, just into product, and that's what they do best." And they need to understand technology a bit, and that's it. And I, I don't want to speak with investors, and I don't want anything to do with sales, and, and, and um, I don't know anything about marketing. And, uh, and then we had a huge crisis around marketing, um, and no one, no one of us knew marketing, so they told me, okay, product is closest to marketing, go do something with marketing. Um, and I fell in love with marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it's, it's really about, and, and there are some things that I don't really like, like sales, for example, um, but to really step into something, learn it, I might not be the best, but I, I will be 
good enough yeah. to, to, to push it and to change something. So yeah. I think this is the main skill, to, to learn new things and, uh, mm -hmm. and to get my hands dirty. Um, I, I leave it with you. I think I'll just I'll just talk so it won't be awkward. Um, so, but I mean, do you think that as an entrepreneur uh, you, or founder, you need to know all of I mean about all of the segments in the in the startup? Because um, you said you learn marketing, yeah. you learn product, you learn. So, what is the the range of knowledge that a founder needs to have? That's a good question. I think that there are so many different types of uh, of founders. Um, S something that um, uh, every year I believe more and more in is that uh, there are so many different uh, shades and colors of people and uh, I know it sounds cheesy but to be your best self and there are some, uh, some CEOs that uh, are really great at everything and can step into any project and there are some CEOs that have this like amazing skill to get everyone to invest in them or to sell anything to anyone and that's enough to, to bring the company to a different level. So I, I think um, th there are different ways to, uh, to manage a company. I've seen lots of different CEOs that uh, do it in a different way. I would say that for me, I do feel that I need to, I need to understand in, any, in everything. Yeah. I do feel that like, the thing that I do best is to connect all the dots and if I don't uh, really understand all the processes, then uh, I can't really do it. Yeah. So that's very interesting for you here, which, uh, whoever who is an entrepreneur here, to really think from what Iris said. I think it's a very important point. Um, I want to take it one step deeper and ask you, so you learned a lot of new skills to survive throughout the years. But how, what was, how, I mean, how did it help you to be a sole founder? Because now you had a few partners along the way, now it's your startup, you're the only founder. What does it take to be a sole founder? Um, so, I'll start by sharing the story. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, so on my first company I had two co-founders, on the second one, one co-founder. Um, and then I left, uh, I left the company. I didn't want to take any one of the key employees because I didn't want to hurt the company. And there was no one that um, I felt that I want to, to start this journey with. So I didn't start the company by myself because I thought this is the best option. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the only option that I had. Okay. Um, but in hindsight, I'm very happy about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one thing that I found very, very important about starting a company is the focus and um, there's always like always imagine it's like you have this image in your head and it's so hard to explain to other people and like I, I know where I want to go but it's really really hard to to connect all the dots for for other people and um, I, I can share an example that uh, like I, I studied architecture the only project that I've done is the designing the offices that we um, that uh, we worked at and um, you know that one, once when we moved to an office and one of the employees told me Okay, now get everything. You, you mentioned so many things so long, over the past two months. I had no idea how it's going to look like, but now that I see it, I understand exactly what you spoke about. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more or less the same with the company. So I, tr I yeah. try to, I really try to communicate my vision. It's really hard and I know how it should feel. Um, and when you have co-founders taking, building this vision is, is harder sometimes. Mm -hmm. And for me, it works really well to have a very, very strong team of uh, managers. Mm -hmm. And I found it that it's easier to bring uh, better management as a sole founder um, because I have more responsibility, because I can give more options, because mm -hmm. I started with more, uh, with more equity. Um, and uh, they have their own kingdom. It's not like we have a co-founder who is a CTO and I will bring a VP R&D and they're not sure yeah. about uh, who is doing what. Um, so I do feel that I have this uh, team that supports me, mm -hmm. um, but they have a clear vision and they can lead it. Uh, I would say that there are some very lonely days, mm -hmm. um, especially during the hard times. Um, I would say that most investors are not crazy about it. Um, something that I always remind myself that mm -hmm. uh, even if they're not crazy about it, if you start with 100% of the shares, uh, as opposed to 30% of the shares, if you're starting with two co-founders, it's like at least two, three rounds. Mm -hmm. So it's equivalent to 
let's say, 15, 20 million dollars, and uh, I'm not sure a co-founder worth it or, is, uh, uh, or having more challenges uh, facing uh, VCs. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I think that... Um, so you shared some of the pros and cons of, of being a sole uh, founder here. And I want to move towards the more of the sales. I mean, now in, in your company, um, you actually uh, have a zero touch approach in terms of sales. I mean, clients just go on the website and just buy from, it's not just obviously, but they buy without having um, a salesperson involved. And I want to ask you, how, how are you actually, how, how did you do that? How, if we have startups here, entrepreneurs, that want to be able to sell in a zero-touch approach. What would be your tips for that? Yeah. So I started with saying that I don't think that this is the best approach. In most cases, it's easier to do enterprise sales and it's easier to raise money if you're doing enterprise sales. Um, the reason I decided to go with a low-touch company is because um, I hate enterprise sales. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, I really suffered from it on my previous company. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I really love marketing, I really love low touch, and I'm a big believer that uh, when you have a low touch company, um, you really need to create a great uh, product. Mm -hmm. Because when you have an enterprise uh, product, you can have the best salespeople <coughs> and to work on a deal, and sometimes they will never use the product, but they will still pay uh, half a million, one million. And when you have someone sign up, uh, seeing a Facebook ad or YouTube ad and sign up to a free trial, and, and they need to decide after a few days if they're going to pay or not, you, you must bring value. So mm -hmm. I, I do feel that something that um, for me really changed over the past couple of years um, with my journey is that even though this entire industry is based on dreams and, and you can dream and you can create a company without any value and still sell it and it can still be amazing, but for me, it's really, really important to create something that people will see value of, and, and it's hard. Yeah. But with a low-touch approach, uh, I can't escape it, for good and bad. Yeah, because you see, like when people want to buy a product, then obviously, like they, it's yeah, they, they vote with with, with the credit up. Yeah, yeah. With, and with the credit card, and uh, yeah. and it's not about it's only about the product and the value. It's not about uh, more salespeople or relationship. Yeah. And I want to go back to, to more of your company. Um, you have about 35 or 40 percent of the company are actually female. And my question is, first of all, was it intentional? And second of all, how does it serve or uh, shape the culture of the company? Um, so it was desired, but it wasn't intentional. I, I would mm -hmm. say that the way I see it, it's, um, it's less about let's reach to 50% female or uh, more diversity around age and so on. It's more about creating uh, a more accepting environment and, uh, um, and to create something very, very welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really done anything to create it. I think that's something that, um, well, today I had an interesting conversation with uh, um, a candidate for, uh, for one of the roles that we have open uh, at Uribe. Um, and he told me that, and we met face to face, and he told me that uh, uh, it's so refreshing to come to a face to face meeting because uh, he can understand how the company, what, what is the energy of the company. Yeah. So that like when you walk in and mm. you have to have like, to spend five minutes within the company and to see how the office looks like and uh, who are the people and what's the energy and how do they speak. And, and they think that this is so true that uh, um, you really feel the energy of the company. And I think probably like most of you when you interviewed somewhere or you, when you came to a meeting, you, you got like the, the DNA of the company um, after a few minutes. And I think that for us it's more about um, the energy that we create and uh, um, and the culture of the company that, um, that brings the, the right people or yeah. the right people for us. And we're going to talk more about actually recruiting in just a few minutes. But before that, um, when we talked, you actually mentioned a lot about um, the sensitivity for people, whether they're your clients, whether they're your um, s um, suppliers or employees. There's a lot of sensitivity to, the, to how they feel or to, to the human, you said behind the, the, the title. 
um, and which is, now I'm sorry, man, for generalizing, but if I generalize, then that would be more of a female-related uh, trait, even though also, of course, men has it. But um, I want to know how does, it, how does it actually happen on a daily basis, this looking at the human behind the, the role or the employee? Um, when we started, when I started with Ruby, um, building the right culture was super important to me and um, I really tried to engineer it. Um, and it really, it, it didn't work out. So when I started with Ruby, I decided that we're going to have a personal uh, growth plan and a professional growth plan and each one of the employees can choose uh, um, their own personal goal. It can be something like uh, learning design, starting a blog, learning um, a course in public speaking and uh, get help in uh, getting to the first lectures. And I always have this like enormous list of things that I want to study and I want to do and challenges. And uh, I really saw my goal um, to help other people progress more on the personal level. And I also saw that it's something that is really going to connect them to the company because we're going to to be the, the platform to help them grow. And, and it didn't work out. So most people didn't know what they want to do. That's something that I found amazing. Like we had this long list of uh, public speaking, writing, networking, um, design, marketing. Um, and we also told them like you can choose whatever you want. And 70% of them said like I'm, I'm not sure and I don't know what they want to do. And for, for some of them, the project was very successful, but for most of them, they didn't know what they wanted to do. They selected something. Then after like two meetings, they decided to pass. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a very important lesson for me that it's really hard to engineer these things. And I remember looking, when I decided that I want to stop with this project, I looked back at my previous company and uh, I told myself that we didn't engineer anything. We didn't have uh, mm -hmm. any, agenda or rules, but it was still an amazing environment and people loved working there. So I think that for me right now, sometimes we do have different projects, but uh, it's more about uh, bringing the right culture and bringing myself. I think that's something that, um, um, that uh, I do, but I don't intend to do it, but uh, I, I yeah. bring myself in a very authentic way um, because I don't have enough energy to put masks and they, I, I whine a lot and they tell everybody about the hard part because they need support. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, this is something that really creates, uh, it really reflects uh, on people. Something amazing that I see with my management is that uh, every time we have a new member to the management and they enter the management meeting, um, they always start with very like facon. Yeah and this is what they've done this week, and these are my goals. And after a month or two months, they start sharing more about uh, what they struggle with and more about the personal mm -hmm. life. So I think it's, it's mainly about modeling, and I think it's, uh, it's really, really hard to, to engineer it. That's also something that we always see with uh, large companies, that they have this, like, uh, forgot the name of like all the, the code of uh, conduct and, yeah, uh, values, and, and, and values and yeah. we strive excellence and so on and, and it doesn't you can't really do anything with it so so it's yeah. like the the commander's spirit Rocham forget what we say it's like you being a model for them in how you bring yourself and then they yeah. feel comfortable to shine in their own way if that's what I'm yeah, and, the, and they think that there are, as uh, this relates to the beginning of the conversation, there are so many different mm -hmm. uh, models. And there are companies that are very aggressive, but everybody are all around it. And they're uh, all about yeah. achieving the goals and uh, competition. And, and it works for them. So yeah. I think that uh, there's no right modeling, but there is something stronger with, uh, with companies in which uh, you, you feel what, what the DNA is. Mm -hmm. Now, the next topic is actually one of, I think, my favorite in, the, in this whole conversation. But before that, I want to ask you, has anyone here ever signed up for, for a job and never got a reply back? <laughs> wow. Only? Only? The, I'm sure the other ones are shy. So because of that, and I'm sure each and every one of you knows the annoying feeling of at least tell me if, if, uh, if I passed, if I didn't, or 
So on, because of that, um, Iris uh, actually came up with, with a concept and a campaign called Fair Hiring Process. So please share more what does it mean and what can we learn from that? Okay, so we closed our uh, Series B um, about five or six months ago. Um, and raising money was, as always, a terrible experience. Um, this is all, is it all recorded? Okay, so, okay, so I won't share everything, but you, you probably get the, get the film and uh, As much as I love uh, working with my employees and entrepreneurs, um, I would definitely skip everything around uh, fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, during the fundraising, I, I found myself, and, and this is the first time that I've done it via Zoom, so it was more disconnected than usual. And I found it amazing that, uh, that VCs that I, uh, um, that I had three, four, five meetings with them um, just uh, ghost and disappear and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and they don't really explain what is the problem uh, if they decide not to invest and um, mm -hmm. the, the entire process for me and that's something that, that they knew and they know it's not personal and, uh, um, and, and they know that uh, it can even be some kind of a compliment because the reason that they don't answer is because they, they want to leave everything open. Um, and after we closed the round and we knew that we're going to, to double the company and we're going to hire lots of people, um, and so that the, the small thing that I can do for the world is to um, help others to avoid this experience. And uh, I'm not going to be a VC, but at least as an employer, I can do my best uh, um, for, pe for people not to have this experience. Um, this is actually something that we were very keen on before. So I wouldn't say that we changed everything, but I knew that since now we're bigger, we have more people interviewing. I want it, but I also want to publish it so other companies will have inspiration. So we start what we call uh, the fair hiring process. Um, this is a very strict set of rules um, saying that we need to give answer to people maximum three days after the interview, whether it's a, it's a positive one or a negative one, that a home assignment won't take more than five hours, uh, that everyone that uh, done a home assignment will get a detailed feedback, um, and we limited the number of interviews that, uh, uh, that we're going to have and, uh, and we wrote about it. We also we had, a, before, uh, before we made the rules, we also had like a very wide survey. Uh, I think like 300 people uh, shared their experience with hiring processes and uh, um, what they think is reasonable for a first interview, home assignment and so on. Um, and we actually want to make also so to make some waves. Um, so yeah, that's something that I'm very proud of, and we we really try to to keep it. It is challenging in many cases because there are some cases that when we interview someone and you can't really give feedback, you just feel that someone is not sharp or uh, not someone that you have uh, good chemistry with, and that's not something that you can write. Um, and sometimes we open a new position and we have like uh, 300 uh, um, CVs a day later coming from LinkedIn and most of them are not related at all. So we not, I wouldn't say that we were able to 100% keep it, but in most cases we do. Even writing to someone that we received your CV and we decided not to, to continue, I think that uh, this is so much refreshing than, to, than other people just sending so many CVs and not getting any reply and to, yeah. to reply to everything on a more personal uh, level. And, and I also like that when you started this campaign, actually you said that the employees shared it on their social media. So kind of gave it waves and shared the word in a way. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think that's the best. Um, so I usually deal mainly with product and marketing because these parts are the closest ones to, to, to feelings. Yeah. And uh, I always find uh, marketing that managed to hit a pain point to be the most successful ones. 
And as opposed to different hiring campaigns where people show how much food we have on uh, this holiday and look at these cool presents that, uh, um, that people get from us. Uh, and all yeah. companies do it and nobody gets excited about this uh, amazing donuts that uh, they got for uh, Hanukkah. Um, I think this part really touches on a pain point, so everybody were very happy to take part in it. They, they find it very important, they, they've suffered from it in the yeah. past, so uh, I, I think it's more about the, the emotional part and yeah. for them to have them doing something uh, good for the world, yeah. for other people. And I really think that this is a great thing that each and every one here, if you run a company, this is a great concept to take into your company uh, when hiring, so the fair, fair hiring process. Um, By the way, I also yeah. add on the, um, on the last inspirational part that it was also, also great for hiring because we were able to mm. create a differentiation and while other startups uh, only speak about the different benefits and the cool office and uh, the cool dogs mm -hmm. and t-shirts. Uh, we speak about values that people care for. And um, I want to move to uh, a, a different kind of topic after we talked about hiring. Let's talk about even a preliminary topic. Um, when, when, a, when you started your path as an entrepreneur, I don't know if it was in the first or second one, but you kind of said that you thought how would you like your lifestyle to be? Because I'm sure when, when starting out, then there's so many dreams, but you, you actually attach the dreams into what lifestyle you want to live in a few years when you'll be successful. So um, if you want to share more on, on that approach. Yeah, um, so when we mm -hmm. spoke about it outside before, you, you called it reverse engineering your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, I think one important decision that they took when uh, when I started Uribe, it was uh, just after I got married. I knew that I want to have uh, kids soon. And I knew that I don't want to be 50% of the time on aeroplanes. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned, I hate enterprise deals. Um, I hate being at the company that when you lose one customer, you can, uh, the entire year can uh, look differently. Um, so when I started the company, I asked myself what, is the kind, what kind of lifestyle I want to have. Mm -hmm. As an entrepreneur, it's, it's always going to be crazy. But it, it mm -hmm. can be crazy, but without lots of uh, flights. Uh, and the other way around, they have like some of my friends, they, they love working with large organizations, they love flying. Mm -hmm. So I think one very important question that, uh, that you should ask yourself uh, before starting a company is what am I good at and what kind of lifestyle do, do I want to, uh, to have, even if it's going to be crazy. Yeah. So that's definitely something I, I bring back to you to think about it. I think it's a great um, concept and an idea that I haven't heard before while speaking to, to founders, entrepreneurs, so I, I'm really happy that you brought it up. The next thing would be something that all of us ha have experienced. Um, two concepts that alone have their own, they stand alone, but they also complement each other. It's about the fact that on the one hand, people always tell you as an entrepreneur, relax, 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 and it's hard to be relaxed. And the second one is about focus. So if you can share your uh, approach to both. Yeah. Um, so one question that uh, I'm being asked once in a while is uh, which advice would you give to your younger self? Mm -hmm. um, and it varies, but I always think that I wouldn't say to myself, take it easy, because I tell it to myself right now and I'm, I'm, I'm unable to do it. So yeah. I think that the entire concept of take everything easy and relax and let go and uh, it doesn't really work. It's um, I think like it's such emotionally. I don't want to use the word roller coaster because I think that most of the time you're just going down, mm -hmm. and and um, and on the emotional feeling, it's 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 really it's like it's so yeah. dense and. Um, so th that's something that I just like came to realize that it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Um, every time I, I learn how to deal with something or to take one aspect uh, uh, more easily, uh, there's always something new that pops up that I never expected. Um, so 
Um, sorry for the bad news. Maybe some <laughs> of you will be able to to learn how to take it easy. Don't don't learn from me. Um, but yeah, something that I definitely that I definitely find very very important is focus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saying when I started um, my first my first and second company, I was always I had so many ideas and initiation and. Uh, um, people always laughed at me that every Sunday morning after the weekend that I had some time to think by myself, I come with lots of different ideas and changes and new concepts. And um, it, it's really disturbing, uh, something that I learned about myself. Now I have two small kids, I, I need to work less, I want to work less. Um, and it means that I have less time to think about disturbing concepts and to drive everybody crazy. Um, so something that I find very, very important is to, to focus. Uh, I always think to myself that the, the greatest companies manage to do one thing right. Mm -hmm. So Google done search right, Facebook done social media right. It's not about, okay, let's have a, we must have this integration and we must have these uh, four different types of login and we need to have this visualization and another dashboard. Uh, it's really about doing a few things well. Um, I can share, for example, that uh, a struggle that I always have with marketing is that I feel that uh, let's crack one channel right and that's enough. If we're advertising on Facebook, let's do more videos, uh, more tests, more landing pages. And every time you think, oh, let's write a blog post about it, or we're not active on social media, or let's uh, try something else. and. Um, I'm not saying that you can do only one thing, but I'm saying that if you're going to focus on, 90% of the efforts are going to be focused on one channel or one task as opposed to 20% over there, 30% over there, and so on, uh, you will see a huge uh, change. And I also, I also feel that um, maybe it's a bit uh, but like when we're. Uh, spiritual. Yeah, uh, spiritual and ruchniki is not exactly the same. Um, but I feel that like where focus goes, energy flows, and when you have something on mind and that's the, the main thing that you think of, in one way or the other it happens. It can take longer, but when you have 10 different things, it's, it's much harder. But do you think focus helps you be relaxed? No. More relaxed? No. No. <laughs> it, still, it still keeps the, yeah, yeah, I have the tension. I have zero <laughs> tips on how to be relaxed. <laughs> I think, as we said, talked earlier, it's probably a built-in thing. Like we need to realize that it will never be relaxed, as yeah, in this field. Uh, and maybe that can relax us if we know that it will never be relaxed. Um, maybe some yeah. of you will. I'm speaking, <laughs> <laughs> speaking for myself, but yeah. Um, now I want to talk a bit about networking. So you know, a uh, small ecosystem, and generally speaking, it's really all about people and all that. How do you network, and especially if you can give some advices back when you started, when you were less known, and what would be your tips to networking? Um, well, I have an interesting perspective about it, and uh, mainly because I, I'm, I'm really lousy at networking. Um, for example, when I came here and didn't know anyone, so at first I just play with my phone and then I was searching for you guys because I know who you are. <laughs> um, so these are my networking skills. And, and it's funny because you came here to hear me and see that probably all of you would love to chat with me, um, but it's, it's really challenging for so me. So how can they get to you after that? They, they can, I just like, I find it hard to get to people, so not the other way to. around. Um, and um, um, when I, even after my first exit, um, I was terrified of public speaking. Um, I hate dinners and other events. Um, but I, I think that networking is very, very important and it really helped me to get to, to lots of places. And, and the path that I took, it wasn't a really, really intentional one. It took me a while to understand that it's working for me. Um, but it was more about getting myself out with uh, writing, with uh, mm -hmm. Public speaking that took me a while, but but mostly with writing. And I remember when I started writing, um, I was sure that I have nothing new to tell people. And there are so many different entrepreneurs that uh, sold companies for uh, larger sums and that uh, have more marketing experience. Mm -hmm. And but I just started writing in, in my own voice. And, 
every couple of months or years they do something differently. It can be something different. It can be a podcast or a, mm -hmm. a writing on different topics or different projects. And, um, and, and that's something that really helps most people know who I am. And then it's much easier to reach out to them. Um, even though, like most people that uh, help me network, or people that are just like I know from Facebook, I just write to them if I need something, mm -hmm. um, but they they really feel that they know me. Um, so so this was my way from networking, and and I feel that today uh, there are so many different uh, ways to create a network and to bring yourself out there, yeah. um, and even if you're going to create a small network, it's it's still a network. Yeah. And you know, my, my main takeaway from what Iris just said is just find your either platform or method that works for you. If, if for you it was writing. And you also told me outside that you even take your developers every few months for like a writing getaway, I would call it. And you really try to give them the skills to get out of their comfort zone, which I think is great to try at least. Yeah, yeah. so this is actually not my idea. This is a great initiative of our VP R&D. Um, and something that we and all companies struggle with is how to get developers to write and we do want to have some tech blog and some presence and every time you ask a developer to write something they always tell, uh, say that uh, they're not the experts or they can't write or they have nothing to write uh, about uh, and something that she initiated is to take all of them every two or three months to some kind of off-site um, and each one of them need to write a post this day. They have six or seven hours, start working on a post, write something. Mm -hmm. And then we have someone from the marketing team who, who edits uh, the post and in charge of distributing the, the post. And I think for them it's, uh, it's a really great experience to see that uh, something that you wrote, uh, people read, people uh, get in touch with you. They're always very worried that they don't have uh, uh, they don't have anything interesting to write about or they're not the best expert yeah. or what people will say because this uh, uh, case study only covers what we've done this month and so on and, and they, they really have this uh, great experience of, uh, of putting themselves out there. Because suddenly people like them, people really read what they have to say and, yeah. and it's a good surprise. That's, yeah. that's great. This is what Deborah they encourage uh, developers yeah. to put themselves yeah. out there on stages and on blogs. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hopefully, we're not sure yet, but hopefully we are in a post-pandemic era. And I want to ask you as a CEO, an entrepreneur, uh, founder and entrepreneur, how did the pandemic affect you or change your view on, on what you do every day? Um, yeah, it's something that... Um, really changed for me as entrepreneur along the years is to um, stay closer to the ground and to really feel what's happening and not to listen too much to, to trends and advices if I don't connect to them. And, and the past year uh, really highlighted uh, this for me. So when COVID started, um, my uh, investors told me, okay, you need to freeze everything, you'll need every dollar, you won't be able to raise money the next year. Um, and we, we lost lots of customers, and, um, but, but then we saw that new customers continue arriving, and we weren't sure what to do with the marketing budget. Um, and then we got to, to the place that we, need, we, we had to raise money, but we had a plateau of a few months, but everybody raised money around us. So, I think it really taught me that nobody knows exactly what is going to happen. Also, like right now, with uh, everybody try to predict if people are going to come back to the office or not. And, uh, um, and I'm really trying to listen to people and to see what the words tell me, what people tell me. Um, and to be less about trends, I think that this past year proved to all of us that we don't know anything and we can't really predict it. And we, we were all sure at first that it's going to take like two months maximum. Yeah. And, and we were sure that people are not going to be effective working from home. And we were sure that uh, we won't be able to raise money this year. Yeah. So yeah, it's to be more yeah. modest and to listen to the employees and the customers and the market. Thank you for that. Now, you know, you've been an entrepreneur since 2006. Now I'm going to ask a very banal question, but we need to ask it. 
I mean, you've been, you, you, you've done it, you've built your company, and how did you do that with building, you know, going dating, finding your husband, getting a family, raising kids, and still, you know, founding another company? How do you do that? Um, on the preparation call, I told you that you shouldn't ask me this question because I don't have any good answer. There are some people that say, wow, I had this babysitter then and this nanny then, I know, and every uh, Wednesday I wake up at 5 a.m. and I have time for... So I have no life, I hardly sleep, everything is chaotic. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my answer. <laughs> I, I didn't get it, and, and, and it's very important for me to be a lot with my family, but I'm also very obligated to, to re-be, and I love my yeah. work. And I do try to also find some time for myself yeah. and some workshops, and, uh, and, and yeah, but everything is a mess, and uh, I, I find myself sometimes not working at all during the, uh, the day itself, and working during the weekends, and... Um, I, I, I have to say that uh, uh, you might expect the other way around, but from one year to another, I have less uh, um, less to-do list. Um, I used to organize my time much better, and they knew what I wanted to do every day, and they had these like meatless Wednesdays and uh, and yeah. so on. And from one year to another, right this understand that I want to flow more and uh, I can't organize everything and the more uh, rules and uh, frames that I, I put to myself um, I feel that it's another thing that I should yeah. um, that I should fulfill and then I feel bad because it was supposed to be meatless Wednesday and I had two meetings so I try not to fight the chaos mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say I mastered it but I would say that it, it works better for me than too many goals and to-do lists. You know, I think that's, that's a very honest answer, and I think that's what being a modern Wonder Woman is. I mean, you know, there is a chaos, whatever, we'll just go with the flow, you do, everyone will take it to where they, they need to as long as, you know, you're happy, you do what you need, so I think that's, 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 that's reality. Um, and one last question before you get to ask Iris questions is um, if or when you'll ever write a book, what would it be about? Um, okay, it's funny to share it here because I've never really cool. spoke about but uh, <laughs> um, I have three books in mind, very different ones. Um, I do want to write a book about entrepreneurship. I think that uh, something that is really missing is some kind of like one, one-on-one for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and just to cover all the basic topics of like how to interview, how to start an idea, how to raise money. Um, not just from my experience, just like all the basics, like the, the, the book that I would love reading like 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, I want to write a fantasy book someday. Fantasy book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a book that I, uh, I, I have in mind, I, if some of you know something, it's something that I looked for myself, but it's... Um, a book for good uh, games with the kids. I think mm. that today there. are... You have a buyer already. <laughs> first, <laughs> first line. <laughs> that today you have you, you can buy lots of toys, but yeah. when you, when you do have some quality time with them, even if it's like ten or twenty minutes, and uh, and they find myself inventing lots of uh, lots of funny games. Mm -hmm. um, so mainly for like toddlers because that's my life right now. But uh, I feel that that's something that I would really love getting. Not and not something like uh, how to create a doll of an owl and you need to glue it. I have to like very boys and hyperactive and they won't do any craft or so. And, uh, and but it's really important for me to have like uh, a more a deeper uh, experience with them. So okay. that's. So maybe, maybe your the next third book. Maybe yeah. your next startup will be for kids. You know, entrepreneurship goes to any sector, so I'm not <laughs> sure that. Uh, I think it's it's a hard one. It's a hard one. Yeah, I'm not sure that this is uh, this is the direction, but uh, but yeah, that's. that's uh, 
So thanks for sharing the, the three ideas. For, I asked for one, but three is, is, is amazing. <laughs> and, and thanks for but, sharing. But here. right now I have time to write like one blog post every three months, so I'm not sure it's how, a uh, it's a good how long it's going to take to, to write uh, all three books. Well, we, we'll, we'll remember that. Um, anybody has questions for us? Yes, what's your name? Hey, my name is Shai Weissman. Uh, actually, I have two questions, but I will try to start off just with one of them. Uh, so I'm a co-founder in one startup, an impact startup, and I was wondering how, how as a sole founder, did you gather the, the, fir the first team? Was it from savings you had before, or was it uh, by offering equities or options? Like, how did you find them? How did you motivate them? Um, what worked best for me was that I, I had my network, and um, but mainly because of the writing, so people knew what I bring to the table, and that really helped me to bring the right people. Uh, but it was all of the above. So um, for the first employees and management, they gave uh, higher options than uh, than other startups, I guess. And that's also something that I believe in. I think that if they are going to stay for. Uh, if it's not going to work out, then we're going to, to, to break this partnership before the first uh, cliff or the vesting. And if they're going to stay with me for like three or four years, I do want them to have a part of the company. Um, and it was also like lots of hard work, uh, countless interviews, meetings, um, replacing some of them after a few months. <laughs> the second question is that how, when you moved between your startups, and so did you have to, because of clipping and stuff, did you have to give a, a, a part of your equities? Yeah, I wasn't fully vested, and, uh, and so yeah, I gave up some of my, uh, my shares. Uh, I have a question. My name is Arif Diamond from Secret Sauce. I have a question about Orivi. Mm -hmm. I read that at a certain point in time, sales weren't going too well, and uh, and you decided to fire half your staff and cut down costs and, and kind of kind of fold in and and, and do some uh, rethinking. And and it seemed to me surprising because uh, my gut feeling as a, as a, as a founder would be if sales aren't going well enough. Maybe we need to hire two more salespeople and buckle up and, and work harder. What, what were the signals that, that made you stop and, stop and say, okay, well, this is, we're confused. We, so something needs to be reworked. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really interesting that it happened a while ago. Um, and it made, like when I wrote about it, there was like an earthquake. And it's amazing because most startups fire, in many cases, they fire like 30, 50% of the employees for different reasons. Um, and I, I'm not sure that business-wise it was the right decision because, exactly because of what you mentioned. And uh, um, because people think that maybe there's something wrong with the company, it was harder to raise uh, funds later. Um, but uh, I'm very happy with this decision. Uh, I was at the point that I felt that um, I'm not with the right team, um, and that uh, the team is not product and uh, customer centric enough. That uh, that things are not going fast enough. Um, I, I just felt that this is not the team that uh, is the right seed for the right company that I want to build. Um, and then I stayed with five people. Um, amazing, very customer, product oriented. We were able to move much faster. Um, so yeah, it was more of a, a personal decision. I think that at, at this point I was, I was able to raise more money uh, because it was very early stages and nobody really measured us uh, based on, the, on sales. Um, but as I mentioned before, something that, uh, that really changes from, for me from one year to another is uh, being closer to my values and to um, creating something that does bring value and not just this bubble. Um, and I'm not sure exit-wise this is the right decision. Question about the management, not about entrepreneurship. You mentioned 
when he mentioned two activities, one that succeeded, that the out, out of site writing stuff, okay. uh, <coughs> suggested by the VTRG, and another one that said that they're trying to engineer the company culture, but they have too many similarities because in both cases you, you kind of um, encourage your people to learn something new. Yeah. Why did one fail and the other one succeed? Did you give more time uh, for the outs outside writing or something else? Um, I think that um, the writing activity is uh, much more framed. It's only like one day every couple of months, takes six or seven hours. Um, it's, it's less up to them. By the way, we, we try not to force anyone. In general, I always tell people, right now we're almost 50 employees. Everything we'll do won't suit everyone. And every time we have uh, a company activity, there are some people that don't like uh, this kind of food or don't like uh, uh, or think that uh, this is silly. So I, I'm not trying to, something that I learned is not, not, to cre not to try to create harmony. It will never work. So also with this, but I think it's much more, it's, um, it's less about the progress. It's less about something that they need to do. It's something that is much easier to, to create. Um, if we would have say like each one of you need to uh, start their own blog and you'll have uh, uh, mentors and time, I, I don't think it would work out. So I think that it's, it's a very small piece, so it's easier. That's a good question. I think something that um, everybody needs to bear in mind that uh, co-founders can be amazing and they can also be hell or just not very... I think something that many entrepreneurs do when they start is to find a technical co-founder because they can't afford a developer. It's not someone that can really lead R&D or have this like amazing, amazing vision and so, sometimes it's someone that you will need to piggyback all the time. Um, so if you don't find the right person, I would say continue on. Um, something that I, I argue with is that uh, many people feel that they need to decide if they want a co-founder or not at the beginning. But there are so many different uh, um, paradigms that you can use. So you might start by yourself, and then a year or two later, um, find someone who can be co-founder, and they won't have 50% of the company, but 20%. Or you might uh, um, hire someone and uh, decide later that uh, they're so central to the company that they'll be promoted to a co-founder with more percentage. Or so. I think that there are lots of different models. Yeah, um, my supporters have always been the management and employees. Um, I'm very open with them. If I don't feel that uh, they contribute much or I count them, so I, I usually let them go. So people that work with me are usually people that I, I really trust. Um, I wouldn't say that they can, that they have, so for example, like with fundraising, they haven't done them it's themselves. They, they can only support more of like the, the mental uh, aspect. Um, lots of decisions we take together. Um, so, so definitely the people that work with me, and it's not only the management, also part of all, also some of the employees.
so yeah, we compete with Google Analytics um, because I feel that there's so much to do around this market. Um, it's not like competing with Google search. Google Analytics is something that serves Google ads, people don't like. I, I wouldn't compete with the product that I think that is, is very good and people love. Um, when we started the Ruby, I thought, okay, there's Google Analytics, there are lots of high-end tools or developers-oriented tools, and there's so much in between that uh, doesn't get answer. Um, Actually, when we tested different messaging on Facebook ads and YouTube ads, um, I, one day I just decided to try something that is head-to-head -head with Google Analytics. We, I didn't start a Ruby with uh, let's beat Google Analytics. So just like there are so many people that don't get answer for any one of the tools and there is a lot to do about this around this space. And uh, I just tried this like one messaging with frustrated by Google Analytics and uh, it, it, it was crazy. So I just felt that they hit uh, a huge frustration, a pain point, and, uh, and it works. So that's why we changed the entire website and all the other ads. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting story because I didn't start a Ruby to compete with Google Analytics, but uh, when I discovered how much people hate it, we found out that this is a very good angle from uh, the marketing aspect. Thank you. Yeah, and then you want to talk? Um, so the question was about the first uh, stage of, uh, of starting a company. Um, I, I think that from one year to another it becomes easier because you don't need, you, you might not earn money, but you don't need to invest a lot. So I remember when, we, when I started my first company, we actually um, we, we rented servers from Bezek. There was no AWS. Mm -hmm. Um, we had like some physical servers on the basic uh, farm and, uh, and it cost more. So I think today it's easier because even with marketing you can start with, um, with a pretty low budget. Um, so I, I tell people that think about it as like your master degree or your degree and people say okay it's, it's very reasonable, reasonable to take like uh, three or four years of my life and be a student and uh, not earn money, but when you tell people that right now you have to, you need to take a year or two, or even like a, a long maternity leave, that's also cool, let's take a year or two um, to rest, but when you tell people let's take a year or two without earning salary, they think like it's crazy. Um, so I don't, need, I don't think that you need much. Um, I do think that on the mental side it's, it's really hard because you, you never know if you're on the right direction, and uh, next week you're going to, to be founded and you're going to create this amazing company or if you're crazy and you're going to continue for five years and nobody is going to invest in you and you're building something that is completely wrong. How do you finance yourself from zero to MVP? What kind of knowledge you need just to start? I, would, I think that the question should be the other way around. What do I know, what, what do I know and... Uh, and, and how to build a company around it. So if you're technical, it's easier. If you're not technical, don't go to these places. Uh, there are so many different other things to do. Um, I think that usually if you're not technical at all and you're trying to work with these like freelancers, uh, it's the wrong recipe. So but when I started the Ruby, I really asked myself, what, am I, what, what do I do best? And what type of lifestyle do I want? Uh, and that was one of the, like, the main uh, factors and reasons that led me to this idea. Thank you. 